Jason Stone. Jason Stone grew up in West Texas and graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. He lives in Austin. He is currently working on a nonfiction book about the real story behind Friday Night Lights. And about our moderator, Matt Walter recently retired after 20 years as curator of collections at the Museum of the Big Bend, located on the Sol Ross State University campus in Alpine, Texas. He earned an MA in history from Sol Ross and taught there for 17 years. Before that, Matt spent 20 years in the US Coast Guard. Much of his time in the service was spent in Galveston, Texas, but he did get to visit 19 countries courtesy of Uncle Sam during his career. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, well, thanks, Florinda. We appreciate all, all the help. And I see Jason on screen now. And hey, Jason. Hello, Matt. Um, uh, Jason and I have known each other for a little over a year now. Uh, and uh, uh, we actually met at a book signing uh, where I was the moderator at our local independent bookstore right here in Alpine, Texas. Front Street Books, and uh, Jason is a West Texan, and he likes coming out here whenever he can. This is uh, probably his salvation. <laughs> and uh, we actually shared a couple of beers last night before he uh, had to go back to the big city. But uh, anyways, it's great to see you on here, Jason. And and uh, uh, I, I don't know if you want to say anything about, about your book before we, we start with some questions. And uh, uh, yep. Do you want to talk? Maybe, maybe, yeah, just talk about your Absolutely. title or talk about the book a little bit. Yeah. And first off, thanks to the Gemini Inc. team. Thank you to you, Matt. Um, it is a big, uh, you know, great thing that Matt is available to do this. He's, he's, he's the true star of the show tonight. So we should be thankful that he is here to uh, bless us with his knowledge of Texas history. So I'm appreciative that he he appreciates the book. Um, the The book is called The Beauty of the Days Gone By. It is about, um, it's a historical novel set in Texas. It's um, two parallel stories. It's really the, the life and times of Charles Goodnight. And for those of you that don't know him, he was sort of a legendary plainsman that lived to be 93 years old. He was born in 1836. And he passed away in 1929. So he saw a bunch of incredible history. Um, he so he's he's looking back on his life and you know narrating all of those details, reflecting on all of that. But the parallel storyline is a um, sort of a kept Indian captivity narrative where uh, a family is depredated. And it plays out from 1866 to 1876. As the two brothers are taken, the older brother is um, uh, adopted by uh, Quanah Parker's band, um, becomes Indianized, and then it plays out through the course of the Texas Indian Wars. So it's uh, a lot of heavy Texas history, and uh, hopefully will be fun to talk about tonight. Listen, Charles Goodnight is a true historical figure. Uh, the the uh, there's been many TV series and mo even movies based on on Charles Goodnight's story. Uh, Lonesome Dove is is is, is based on on uh, uh, on Charles Goodnight's story. Uh, he's also a kind of an amazing historical figure. He's the guy that helped save the buffalo from extermination. Uh, and he's the one that, that invented chuck wagons for the cattle drives. Uh, and the the good night loving trail still exists. You can still, still there's still people that follow it on horseback. Uh, every year they'll they'll ride from from West Texas all the way up to, to Wyoming uh, to follow that. And uh, um, and of course his story ties in here with uh, with West Texas. So. The other thing that Jason didn't mention, uh, this book is incredibly descriptive as far as the land goes. Wonderful, colorful descriptions of this special place in the world. And so uh, one, of the, one of the things I want to ask Jason, 
how many of these places you described did you travel to personally? You know, over the course of my life, Matt, pretty much all of them, you know. You had to, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, as you would get into the research of the book, obviously taking specific trips, being mindful of the terrain and all of that. But, um, yeah, I guess what now, 50 plus years of traveling through those trails. So. Yep. And those trails are, are famous trails and, and places like uh, like uh, Horsehead Crossing. You've been there probably a couple of times. I yes. mean, it's amazing to see how they would cross that river, cross the Vegas. And that's when you enter the true American West, I think. 100%. And um, So, Jason, would you like to talk for a minute uh, about your title? Yeah, so the beauty of the days gone by is a, is a bit of a nostalgic title. Um, it, it came to me from a Van Morrison song. And if you listen to the words of the song, it, it'll sort of evoke uh, that nostalgia and you know you think about Charles Goodnight being in his 90s facing his mortality looking back on his life and times I thought that I would take a moment to read a few passages from the uh, the novel and I'll do this chronologically and sort of break it up and explain where it resides as as part of, of the storyline um there's another key character named Jay Evans Haley, who was a well-known scholar back in the day. He he knocked on Goodnight's doorstep when he was in his early 20s. And his job was to collect folklore from all the old timers before he passed away. So um, essentially, Goodnight agreed to embrace him. Um, they started a process of getting to know each other. Uh, Goodnight would tell the stories of, you know, what it was like back in the day. So this first passage is a, a journal entry of um, Haley uh, refle reflecting on a day or a couple of days that he has spent with, with Charles Goodnight. And hopefully you'll get a, a sense of the character of Goodnight, who was a pretty crusty old guy. It says, when he enters the office wearing a white Sunday shirt, hanging loosely with suspenders, supporting a pair of massive trousers pulled well above the navel, there is a moment of speculative silence, a pause perhaps out of respect, perhaps of apprehension, and the obligation to assess the mood of an old man who teeters on the brink of an extreme gentleness and fierce agitation. His bow-legged walk is seesawed, and he commands his cane with a flare, stomping or pointing for emphasis, he still seems large, despite his shrunken hunch, and his great shock of white hair is usually disheveled and yet somehow a charming accent. His features are rough-hewn, accentuated by enormous ears and a stern, skinny-eyed stare, a fascinating veneer for a man who often shows such a wide range of interests, combined with deep sincerity, compassion, and wisdom. His speech is low and gravelly, but with such depth and emphasis, feeling almost biblical, as if possibly because of such extreme hoarseness to come from someone who is intentionally modifying their voice for a certain effect. And yet his authenticity amazes me. And there's very often a very, a clever little twinkle in his eye and energy about him. Kara's characteristic is the fast bouncing of his right knee, not a nervous habit, but seemingly a trait that helps him focus and pull amazing details from the recesses of his memory. And then it carries on a little bit but the point that's a little more entertaining is, you know, more details of his manner of speech um, or contrasted against his incredible ability to cuss a salty diction birthed of the trail, educated by the likes of Jim Bridger, Kit Carson, Lucian Maxwell, and influenced by Indian and Spanish slang. No matter the audience, preachers, women, children, all welcome beneficiaries. The authentic nature of his articulation stems not only from the vocal fatigue, the frequent, frequent coughing fits and throat clearing, but from the poetic blend of a strong Southern accent, truly a Texan accent, not from the Deep South, an inventive expletive phraseology. No matter the topic, serious or sanguine, his senses are often linked by accents such as son of a bitch or some form of goddamn and various philosophical religious blasphemies. 
And yet the symphony in which it is issued never seems to give offense, as there is a lyrical purpose that results not in true profanity, but its very own vernacular of a time that will eventually be lost forever. I've never heard any man toss more beautifully in such varied ways or with such eloquence. But most of all, I'm over, overwhelmed with the depth of his nature and strength of his character. The brusque exterior is simply a mask. Being in his presence has forced me to consider my own mortality and imagine unthinkably what I might be like if I'm fortunate enough to experience what life has to offer for another 65 some odd years. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure yet how to make good use of these interview sessions, but I sense something spiritual underway. So the way that relationship manifested was it ended up being in the biography of Charles Goodnight, which is still in print today after coming out in the 1930s. Um, for those circles, it's a pretty legendary publication. But the idea was to sort of place yourself in the shoes of a, of a young man who's in the presence of a guy who's, who's seen so much over the course of his life. And who'd met so many people. Um, and was admired by so many. So, I think Theodore Roosevelt really admired his language. <laughs> yeah, he probably did. All right, the next two passages are pretty quick, but it'll it'll sort of pass you through the 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 pieces of the book. You know, you've got the the older man looking back on his role in things, and then you have the more immediate, um, you know, captivity narrative. There's a buildup to a big depredation of uh, a Kiowa raiding party in the hill country, and they 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 take away uh, quite a few captives after destroying the house. And the the core of that narrative is about two two brothers that are taken captive, and this is this is the first scene of them riding away from from that big depredation. It says. Uh, they rode into the burning afterglow of dusk, the early night stars gleaming, hurting the Bermuda and their seven white captives onward into the pale orange twilight through the rock-strewn prairies and over the hills along the trails up into the sprawling plains. Charlie had been hauled away by a newly appointed war chief named Amanti who had risen to prominence as a shaman. He possessed the gift of prophecy of which he procured from the screech owl and in his medicine bag was a puppet of cured owl skin. Perhaps he saw the young boy as a future warrior, a pupil in the Rabbit Warrior Society who would come to know life much as had he, and he observed his nature carefully as he rode. Riding along after sunset in the slow change of twilight before total darkness, the captives began to come to terms with their fate, and it brought on in them a new sort of terror. Stripped of their clothing with their pale white flesh exposed in the cold spring night, they were shredded by the brush and bleeding and bruised, and their backsides were blistering up from the endless rubbing of sweating horse flesh. And in case you're wondering about the names, the two brothers that are taken are named Sam and Charlie. And Charlie, um, it could be a bit confusing just hearing it based on these readings. There's Charlie Goodnight, and then there's also Charlie Terry. And, and that plays into the thread of how um, good night is is uh, looking back on his role in all of these times. All right, two more passages, um, and I'll try to make it fairly quick. Uh, after they go through some trials and tribulations, they make it into the Kiowa camp up in the Panhandle. Um, they spend a few months. And the older brother is eventually traded to a, a band of Kahati Comanches um, under the, the tutelage of, of a young Quanah Parker. And uh, so essentially he's having to leave his brother against his will. And this is the scene of him being carried away, leaving his brother. It says... But the next morning when the Kahatis rode out, Charlie was not with him. Sam was on a fresh pony, turning slightly in the saddle, holding back tears. He looked back at his little brother running desperately behind them and crying out. The squaws held him back. They rode away from the village on the trail of the Pecos, the sun rising behind them, their shadows long before them. When they reached the ridge that would take them out of sight forever, he looked back one last time. The breeze fell silent, and he could hear the voice of his brother in the faraway distance. 
the little boy now small on the prairie with his arms flailing as the women fought to hold him back. So a little bit, a little bit of a poignant scene there. And I will now fast forward to. And this is one of your most colorful scenes coming up. And so for those who are not familiar with the history, essentially what happened is um, the Native Americans were defending their territory against Anglo encroachment. And there was the massive class clash of cultures. The boys, uh, the older brother was Indianized. Um, and then the, the Texas Indian Wars played out. So there's a, there's a decent portion of the narrative that, that covers that component of it. At the end of those Indian Wars, um, the Comanches, the Kiowas, and, and some other uh, tribes were defeated in the Palo Duro, in the Battle of the Palo Duro in 1874. And because of previous history, um, the military... Um, they had captured over 1,500 horses, and rather than letting those horses live, um, they knew that the, the Native Americans would, have, would eventually raid and try to take them back. So they wanted to end the, um, they wanted to put an end to it in any way that they could. They, they slaughtered the buffalo, they harassed uh, the various tribes. They wanted to ruin their food sources, and they wanted to take their their key sacred source of of money and spirituality, which was their their horse uh, their horse wealth. Frankly, the 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 patrol, the cavalrymen, were tasked with killing fifteen hundred horses, and all of these men were ultimately horsemen themselves. Their, you know, their livelihood was based on their horse. So if you can imagine how difficult that situation may have been, there's a big lead up to this uh, where they're all questioning what they're being asked to do. Um, but essentially, this is, this is kind of the details of what happened. Um, the near man serving as gatekeeper let the first horse slip through. It was the weanling, and it took the rope uncertainly and walked the slack out tight. Bernard spoke to it and stroked its neck, and when he put the muzzle of the 44 to the animal's temple and fired and the little thing slumped dead, he swung back away from it and bent down, gagging in disgust. The next horse in line reared and screamed. A panic spread through the entire herd. There were 100 men in the immediate vicinity and perhaps another 400 in the extended camp. To a man, they stood in silence. The Tonkawa scouts were nowhere to be found. Mackenzie set his horse near the firing squad. Let's get on with it, he said. A man ran and undid the rope. The next horse came out jerking its head and stomping, a gorgeous milk-white mare. The lead rope ran out again and Bernard blew a hole through its head. When it fell, its legs doubled under and its arched neck turned down the side, its muzzle resting gently in the trampled and blood splattered, splattered grass. Four more horses came down the line and Bernard emptied his rounds and stepped aside for the next man, shuffling to the back of the line to reload and watch the carnage. By now it was chaos inside the stockade, the wide-eyed horses foaming at the mouth, pacing and prancing with their ears pinned back and nostrils flared, squealing and grunting, bunching and milling, tails switching hard and fast. At first the shots were slow and steady. Each man took their turn, six shots each. They were deliberate and shot well, and the dead piled up a horse per minute, but the math did not add up. Mackenzie ordered another killing line to the east and another running west. The pace of shooting picked up, and by mid-morning, they had established a rhythm to the work. The big breeder stallions required two or three successive brain shots, collapsing like freight trains, flailing their legs, trying to get up. They groaned like humans. Counters tallied the horses as they entered the lines, and teams of draggers kept the piles in check. Wagers were made on the final reckoning. Slowly, the herd thinned out, becoming more and more desperate. A colt made a rush to hurdle the blockade and clipped its legs mid-jump, crashing down in a flurry of flailing whips, and then it was shot. By noon, the sun was full up and it was hot. No time to break for lunch. Their food was brought to them in the field and they ate as they worked, flies swarming and, and the constant pistol fire and the smell of urine and blood and running manure. The prairie grass trampled the dust now and a thin brown haze floated in the sun the early afternoon. 
in the early afternoon, there was a concern the ammunition wouldn't last, and they began to separate the colts, and one by one knocked them in the head with the hatchets. They kept the horses moving. Shouts and yells, cane poles and whips, grunts and squeals, and the mares crying out for their foals. At 314, the last horse was led from the slaughter line, a gentle old sorrel mare. She was rolling her eyes and snorting softly, but otherwise seemed to accept her fate. The hostler led her out. She stood still, head down. When the man fired, she crumpled down heavily and fell to her side. From any angle, she looked asleep. Lying there peacefully, a thin trickle of blood oozing from her mouth. The man stood there looking over her. He put his nose in the crook of his arm. Others slowly began to gather around. Nothing was said, and the new signs from the lack of shooting hung over the killing field like an evil pall. After a while, the dust cleared and the sky was blue all over the prairie. Gradually, they wandered away from the killing fields, talking quietly among themselves like men returning from a funeral. Mackenzie sat his horse watching them, thinking, planning. He looked to the north where on a rise he thought he saw a lone Comanche scout observing them, but he paid no mind. So kind of gruesome as those times were, but um, the idea- You wanna mention who McKenzie was? Yeah, Randall McKenzie was in charge of the, of, of the troops. He was a well-known Indian fighter and he had a hard job and, <laughs> and uh, that's who he was. He did it. Yeah. Yeah. But Jason, that's, uh, I mean, some incredible scenery. And, and, and do you, would you like to talk a little bit about um, how did you, what's your writing style? Do you sit down at five o'clock in the morning and write, or, or, or uh, how, how do you write a book? You know, you I, I don't. It, it's hard to articulate that. If I knew what I was doing, I, I could probably do it better. I would just say that um, the book took me a very long time. It was a labor of love, a hobby that was based on the history uh, and the love for the state and a passion for what all of those people must have gone through. So I didn't really know what I was doing. And ultimately, um, you know, I hacked it out over 15 plus years and wrote it in phases and start and stop. Um, you know, I, I, I do like to get in grooves where, you know, I can work for hours at a time, um, typically in the morning, early in the morning, and then I save the afternoon for reading and research. And it, it really just varies based on what I'm researching, what I'm writing, and and the the type of scene and emotion that I'm trying to evoke. And how do you do your research? Uh, my wife would would uh, would laugh about that. Um, a lot of books. Uh, we you know I collected quite a few books over the years. So, and again, that's what that's that's sort of what drove the whole thing is just a love for you know, reading the history and trying to distill it and then ultimately replicate that in modern times for modern society to appreciate what went on so so that history isn't lost. But it was a matter of thinking through a scene um, as it might play out in the book. You know, the, if any of you take the time to read the book, you'll, you'll notice that there's phases and... Uh, all of that corresponded with the type of research that I was doing to, to try to, to get to the bottom of, of what was going on. And there's a lot of characters involved in the book that are, that are true historical characters. Uh, and, and they left narratives also. So there's a lot of reading for you to do. There's a lot of reading. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, for example, the, the horse slaughter that you, that you heard, there's not too much on that. So you kind of had to put yourself in that place and understand what may have gone on. But with regards to the, the termination, the extermination of, of the bison, um, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of common literature um, and history, but there's also a lot of obscure stuff. And it was, so it was fun to try to track down the obscure stuff and, and, you know, the journal entries, the narratives, the stuff that wasn't necessarily professionally documented or rented or, or, or written 
Um, and, you know, you just kind of built off of all the books that have been written before to try to piece together the history and the story. And one character you mentioned, uh, I think we need to get a little bit more into, Quanah Parker. Who is yes. Quanah Parker? So I'm sure that everyone has heard Quanta Parker, heard of Quanta Parker. He um, was uh, half white, um, half uh, Comanche, uh, was was taken captive as a young man and raised as an, uh, an Indian. And he, um, so he, so he had some very unique genes, unique blood, unique experiences. And as a young man, he started to separate himself um, as a leader, as a warrior. Um, he, you know, and, and everything that you read in any, in, in any book that's out there, you get the sense of how well-rounded and intelligent, um, and even worldly, um, for for how things were back in the day he was definitely his own person and he did his own thing um but some of the some of the things that i enjoyed exploring and 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 this is historically documented uh not with my fictional characters but with real characters is how he he was open and amenable and took other uh cultures under his wing as part of his crew his his society and yeah you know he fought to the end and was a leader uh during the indian wars and then once once it was all over he was savvy enough to adapt and continue to try to lead his people into into the future so it was a, it was a pleasure learning more about his life and times yeah yeah he was the last war chief of the of the comanches but he was very very flexible uh it's also interesting how the university that I that I worked for for 20 years and where I got my degree is named Saul Ross, named after Texas Ranger, Confederate General, uh, Texas Governor, a &M, Texas A&M President, Lawrence Sullivan Ross. Uh, the, did you come across any tie-ins with, uh, with, uh, with Lawrence Sullivan Ross and, and, uh, uh, and Quanta Parker? Yeah, absolutely. And in the early days, some of Good Knight's background it was, you know, he was an early trailblazer, an early guy, a young man trying to make his way in the cattle business and during the Reconstruction period. And there was such chaos that he volunteered to help defend his home, defend the frontier against the Native Americans. And um, he joined a regiment of Texas Rangers led by Sol Ross. So they had a relationship. Um, they scouted. Um, they did what they needed to do to try to defend it. Uh, and one little interesting tidbit is that Sol Ross ended up going on with political aspirations. And, and in his old age, Good Knight didn't have a lot of fond things to say about uh, Sol Ross. So. Yeah, Sol Ross, uh, he's the one that actually rescued Cynthia Ann Parker yeah. uh, against her will. Um, and that's what one of his claims to fame. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't think Charles Goodnight liked, uh, liked Lauren Sullivan and Ross at all. <laughs> there was no, no, no love lost there. And hey, Matt, it's funny that you bring up that part of the history. For those of you that don't know it, um, Goodnight one of the ironies of the story that, that I attempt to tell is that Goodnight was on a particular scout and got into an engagement and then basically discovered Quanta Parker's mother, who was brought into cap captive or brought into captivity under the Anglos, never really made it, um, never really uh, succeeded. Um, but, you know, in my narrative, he is Goodnight is also involved in you know the, the other family's story, and so it's, it's a little bit ironic that he um, he was part of of the an initial engagement that got to Cynthia Ann Parker, and then he's also part of the story of her son Quana, who ends up being a mentor to the oldest boy that's taken captive.
And then in real life, uh, Cynthia Parker and Quanta Parker are buried together at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And have you been to Fort Sill to go to see their burial sites? Yes, so, I sure have. So, and, 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 and Western Oklahoma is still a, is an amazing place to travel to where a lot of that stuff happened. Um, but do you want to talk about your, some of your, some of your travels in pursuit of this book? Yeah, for sure. Blake, Blake was talking about going to the, the Palo Duro um, yes. before we joined. There was one memorable road trip uh, going up there to research at the museum, which is an amazing place. Um, highly recommend anybody attending that and experiencing that at uh, in Canyon, Texas, Panhandle Plains Museum. But, you know, you hear the stories of the of the soldiers and the marches and you imagine what they had to go through leaving the middle of the state and marching up um, into the panhandle. Matt, on one particular trip, I hit a norther in February and it was crazy. It went from 75 degrees to 15 degrees with sleet and snow. And then the, the military accounts of some of those campaigns, the exact same thing happened. Um, and if anybody reads the book, you know, some of that is represented as, as they're up there pursuing that stuff. But um, the that route from the hill country and all of those waterways uh, that, you know, that you look at on a map, the Brazos, the Colorado, all the sub tributaries that feed into that, those were all highways um, from the Panhandle Plains, the base of the Cap Rock on top of the Cap Rock. That was their territory, the term, you hear the term Comancheria, um, that was sort of their hub, and then they would raid through those those waterways as sources to the, the ranches in Texas and steal horses, take captives, ultimately defend their territory. So a lot of the travels would weave in and out of, of those areas, um, including Good Knight's original home and rangeland, which was up sort of west and north of the Waco area where they started the, you know, the initial good night loving trail was where they gathered their cattle and they trailed them west um, <clears throat> through the San Angelo area. And then on the way to Horsehead Crossing on the Pecos River and then up the Pecos River um, in, into New Mexico where they would, would sell the cattle at, at a profit. Yeah, those cattle drives are are are, are interesting, uh, especially the Good Night Loving Trail towards the end. They're going all the way up into Wyoming to fatten the cattle and then drive them back to the railroad. That's right. Um, so. Yeah, I didn't. I've been through New Mexico over the years, but it put a different lens on it, thinking about what New Mexico must have been like with the the Rio Grande River and and the Pecos River being major thoroughfares and sources of life and and ultimately highways for you know where they were moving cattle um to deliver them to market yeah and and of course those were the routes to take because you needed water for yourself and, and the and, cattle and you had to go around the the territory in the panhandle of texas that was controlled right. by the comanche and kiowa indians and and they were they grade all the way down into mexico they absolutely did. In fact, there's a portion of that, and I couldn't believe it when I first started reading it, but they would they would move from the Lubbock Amarillo area. Uh, they would take summer excursions or winter excursions to leave the cold of, of the panhandle and go all the way down into the middle of Mexico, raiding those those ranches for um, for horses and captives. And did you ever come across the term Comanche Moon? I've heard it a time or two. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of their raids took part during full moons. So, it, the, al almost like the the moon that you posted last night of that incredible photo that you took. And the, well, that was a uh, it was pretty neat to to finally see the moon again. I'm not going to see it tonight. So, yeah, but, but the uh, full moon's like, coming up here in a couple of days. A couple of days, a couple of days, and hopefully it'll be clear. I think it's going to clear up. So, looking yeah. forward to to seeing the full moon. The uh, the March or yeah, late March full moon. Um, so 
when you follow these paths and you're taking back roads and you're looking at little historical markers in the middle of nowhere, what are you driving? Wow, that's a good one. I am driving a 2000, well, back then, what was it? It was a 2012 Tacoma. And then over the, I mean, it took me 15 years to get through all of this, all, all the writing of that book. So there were multiple trucks, but there was two Tacomas. And are you camping or? Not, not all that much because I needed to be close to, uh, the museums and be productive and get in there and see the sites. I, there is one memorable trip where we did camp down in the Paladuro and the, and the CCA cabins that were built back in the thirties. And uh, my son and I were down in there one, I guess maybe a cold fall night and really just trying to soak it in what, what it was like in the middle of that country at night and during the day, but we we attempted to start a fire and it didn't ventilate very well. So after we went to bed, we woke up in a ton of smoke and <laughs> and had to air that thing out. But uh, that that was that was probably the roughest night that we had on road trips trying to research things. Yeah, well, wintertime road trips in West Texas and, and into New Mexico. I mean, that weather can change so dramatically. As you Definitely. well know. Yeah. Um, the Panhandle Plains Museum, you mentioned that. That is actually the largest museum in Texas. It's an amazing museum. And, and uh, so anybody that needs to do research on West Texas, that's one place, definitely one place you got to go. But mm -hmm. other museums that you might have visited, uh, can you talk about them at all? Sure. Yeah, the, the Briscoe Museum or the Briscoe Library in Austin what was definitely key. Um, but primarily it would be, you know, uh, Fort Concho, um, Fort McCavitt, the, the small facilities that they have there that are, that are still very informative and, you know, supported by volunteers and, and local people that do a good job of preserving the history there. But it was mainly little spots like that. Um, but the Panhandle Plains Museum was was one of the primary, other than all of the books that I acquired over the years reading, and then and then the Briscoe and Austin. Did you make it to Fort Lancaster? I did make it through Fort Lancaster. Yes, that's, and then that's there, there was there was portions, Matt, of writing that book where I had all kinds of sidebar trails where they would go down south and west into the Big Bend area, but ultimately I ended up cutting a lot of that because it didn't quite fit in and i was i was on too wild of tangents too yeah yeah to, yep. to make that work as part of the narrative yeah because out here of course it's a a, a smaller tribe the apache tribe and yep. they were actually pushed into west texas by the comanches 100 um, percent. yep uh, and that's a whole different narrative there with the buffalo soldiers and uh, and, and all that so you travel to these places uh, and visit these museums and historical sites and talk to people. How did you take your note? Did you take notes? Yes, I did take notes. A lot of notes. Um, I like moleskin journals that are plain in the extra large fashion. I always put stickers on them and I label them the dates. Typically they would last three to six months and i have a stack that's like that um that i'll probably burn at some point but there's some pretty amazing things in there just from notes and collections and attempts to write and that that's how i would collect you know collect all of that stuff and then when you sit down to actually physically do your writing uh you're not using some old olivetti or something uh are you are you typing on a computer? Or I am. A yeah, laptop? I'm, using, I'm using a laptop. I'm using Word. I don't know how the old school guys did it. Um, something needs to be written about that. But the modern tools that we have at our disposal in terms of word processing and availability to research online, 
you know, all of the amazing online resources that you can get access to. If you have a question about grammar, if you have a question about some subtle thing, uh, this was a little bit before AI was starting to emerge. That's only going to add layers to the benefit of research. And I think in a positive way, but um, yeah, I just use my laptop and, and hack away yeah, you, in a Word you, document. You need to find out when Randall McKenzie was born. You can just look that up. You know, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and you, uh, and, and you think yeah, about how different it was back back in the day when the old guys were writing that stuff. It was way different. We have we have like the Peter Botanica or something like that, and they had to go yeah. to open the book. Um, yeah, it, it it is amazing. Um, how easy is the craft of writing to you as as far as the words go? Finding the right word. Yeah, it's definitely not easy. Um, there are times when you can get in flow and that typically comes on the heels of a lot of uh, dedicated writing and research where you know you're not you're not starting and stopping where you're carrying on from one session to the next day to day and you can build some sustained momentum. Um, so it's not easy, but there are times when it's easier than others, but most of the time it's a pretty difficult slog um, to try to work through it. And I, I mean, if there's any, anybody out there that, that I could try to share something with that might add value and help, I, I just tried to take it scene by scene and simplify it rather than looking at the whole. And then once I would get through that particular scene, understand where it fits in the context of the whole. So it's a matter of looking out and then looking in and then constantly doing that over and over again. And would you talk a little bit about the, the procedure uh, that will come later, the, the editing and eventually the publishing? Yes, I would love to do that. Um, the revisions, one thing that surprised me, so this is my first novel. I'd written a non nonfiction book. Uh, this was my first attempt at a novel. It, 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 it sort of got out of control because I was so interested in different lines of research. But um, ultimately, my naivete as a writer, my inexperience as a writer, and, and the scope of what I was trying to articulate was too much. So the revision process was extremely ex extensive. Um, but what I would like to say is once I had it down with a decent cradle to grave draft where the, the, the storyline made some sense, I was fortunate enough to get connected with someone who became my editor, Martha Jones, who is a longtime uh, native Texan, extremely well-read, very soulful, uh, understands the history, and she luckily took a liking to the history and the story, and she was instrumental in helping me shape that uh, that story into what it's become now, into a readable format, hopefully. And then uh, as far as publication? Yeah, that was that was kind of a strange thing. Um, if you haven't been through it before, um, you know, get ready. But there's there's a query process. You you've got to solicit your idea in the form of a query to agents who represent it to publishers. Um, it's not fun. <clears throat> it's not easy. And um Ultimately, what happens is somebody takes a liking to it and decides, let's get it into the production process. We believe in the story. And that's when the real fun starts, uh, because it's just going to be continually um, editing, revising, tightening it up, collaborating with that staff um, who has expertise on the editing process, the copy uh, copywriting or copy editing component of it to tighten up the grammar. There's debates over theme and style and story and grammar. 
um, where you try to maintain control of the manuscript. And then ultimately, um, it's going to get designed. There's going to be a cover. You've got to pick uh, the photo. I could I could have a whole nother session on what that process was like. I'd prefer not to really talk about it ever again. <laughs> uh, but, because it's necessary and fun, but it's not it's not like uh, it's it's not anything like what the creation of the manuscript was like. And even though you don't want to talk about it, can you talk about the cover? The cover was very fascinating. Um, we were trying to find something specific to the panhandle, but some of the families up there who had historic photos did not want to release rights to those photos. So we tried to find something that was representative of the of the period and the theme and the image of what it was like to be a a pathfinder, a settler uh, back in the day. And so uh, they had to shrink that image. It's a covered wagon. It's some settlers. You know, it's a fairly desert like looking landscape behind it. But they had to shrink that drastically. The beauty of that image is that it's a giant panorama. So you get the full mule train and you're you're like it's 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 as if you're in a plane or in a in a car looking out on a railroad track of you know miles and miles of train it's it's an amazing scene but she ended up shrinking that in to try to hone, hone in on that image to make it make sense that's a great image for the for the cover um and i like the the contrast with the color of the of the title too so um who are some of the some of the authors or, or books or the, the, the kind of, and I know I'm putting you on a spot because we didn't talk about this, the books and authors that, that helped influence you on doing this. Sure. Um, there would be so many um, nonfiction type books. Uh, you know, back in the day, Frank Doby sort of got me interested in history I went, I went to UT, uh, read all of his stuff. And by the way, Dobie makes a, a, a cameo at the end of the, at, at the end of the book with, with good night. For those of you that might know of Dobie, um, <clears throat> Jay Evans Haley, I would say would be one of the bigger influences and he plays a major role. He was a real character. Um, he ended up running for governor, um, in the, in the 1950s, I believe it was, uh, but, he and Doby were uh, cohorts in the early 1900s as young men trying to document all the folklore and the history of the day. And, and they were both very prolific. And they inspired me not only for their appreciation of the history and their dedication to wanting to document it for future generations, but uh, their, their work ethic, their... Uh, their collection of 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 the of the things that they studied is pretty amazing uh and then it goes off from there with regards to um modern writers i i would put a shout out to sc gwen um who wrote empire of the summer moon which was an amazing book uh that uh, was super inspiring and it has a lot of ties into the the overall narrative. And then um, I guess with regards to trying to understand literature and the way that that has been evoked, I, I would probably call call out Ernest Hemingway and, and Cormac McCarthy as as the two major influences. All right. Well, those are, of course, fantastic authors. Yeah, I'm reading a Gwyn book right now on uh uh, the, uh, the the shipwreck uh, in, in South America. Have you read that book? I have so, not read it, so, but I want uh, to. It's an amazing book. So, uh, anything that I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Not really. We so, could go on forever. Yep, and we haven't talked trout fishing in the West yet. So, <laughs> but uh, 
I, I guess it's probably time we can we can uh, open up and open, see if there's any questions. I can't tell. Um, I can't see here if there's any any uh, any questions have been asked. But uh, hey, um, uh, Matt, we got a question from Mary. Um, I also have a question, but we'll this okay. Is, uh, but we'll do um, we'll do Mary's question before mine. Uh, okay. Mary just says uh, your book is nicely designed and produced. Will you tell us uh, why and how you chose your publisher, Story Farm? Story Farm was a, a reference of a close friend. This book is big and it's historical and it's not really tied into popular uh, genres in fiction. So it was, it was a hard sell for um, the establishment, if you will. So Bob Morris runs Story Farm. He uh, took a liking to the book and um, is an author himself back in the day and understood what I was going through. And so he agreed to sort of take it on as, you know, a boutique independent um, publishing firm and support, sponsor, do what he could to try to, to bring this, this story to the public. That's great. Okay. So that's how you kind of got linked up with Story Farm. Um, I think that answers Mary's question. You know, my own question as I was, you know, I love reading uh, nonfiction books. I love reading historical fiction. And, you know, I love Robert, uh, Robert Cairo. I don't know if you've read any of his books about LBJ or if you, there's a great, um, he, he wrote a book about writing just called Work. Um, and then there's this great documentary called Turn Every Page. Mm -hmm. um, which was a chronicle kind of a, of the 50 year professional relationship between the Pulitzer prize winning Robert Cairo and his, his editor, literary giant, Robert Gottlieb. Mm. And you know, you're talking about going around to all of these, um, sites, doing research, take, taking notes. And my question has to do with something that Hillary uh, Mantel said, who wrote the Wolf Hall books. I don't know if y'all have read the Wolf Hall books, but Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Gross was interviewing her on uh, Fresh Air, and she said, "Why, why not write a nonfiction book? How come you've fictionalized these characters?" And uh, Mantell said, "Well, the reason that a historical, so an author of historical fiction writes a novel instead of a nonfiction book, is because we know what the characters did, and we write fiction to understand why they did what they did." And so you have this great cast of characters in your novel and you wrote it over 15 years. And so my question is, as you had researched and took all these notes and you're finally sitting down to write one scene at a time, was there anything that a character did that surprised you, even though they're coming from the pages of history where you had spent so much time with them, you've been to museums um, and they kind of took on a life of their own in the pages and you kind of had to contend with why they did what they did. You knew what yeah. they did. So can you just talk a little bit about the interiority and the motivation when you're writing those characters? For sure. That's an, that's a great, great question. And thank you for the reference on Cairo. <clears throat> I haven't had the time to read that. I've known about his work. My son's been into it. I have friends that have been into it, but in particular, the reference that you made to his, his other work on the writing of it and his relationship. So I'm, I'm going to be into that. Thank you for that, Blake. Um, but with regards to fictionalizing history, um, I don't know. It's hard to articulate. It's a little bit of a feel thing. It, 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 I really enjoyed thinking about what it would be like if I was there. So I tried to place myself in those moments which i hope organically comes out to help the reader understand what it must have been like in those moments you know nonfiction is amazing but it can be pretty generic and in my reading over the years with good historical fiction it was profound and extremely impactful compared to just reading the nonfiction component of it so i was really just trying to get as deep as I could get about what the human experience would be like in the, in those times. And yeah, that's, that's probably the, the best way that I could answer that. Oh, that's great. That that's great. Yeah. I mean, just living with the characters on the page, I'm sure that's, that's probably how that went. Um, 
Well, that was kind of my burning question. Are there any others before we uh, wrap up here at the top of the hour? I've really just enjoyed uh, this discussion and um, made me want to go, you know, take the book, your book as a companion piece to some of those museums uh, that I've never been to. And I want to thank Matt for such great moderation tonight. But are there any last minute questions before we uh, we adjourn for this evening? Well, I want to thank you, Jason, uh, for coming on, talking about your process, your novel, and for reading from it. And Matt, just for leading us uh, over the past hour through Jason's process and his work. So um, thank you both so much. And uh, we'll put this up, up on YouTube so we can revisit it. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Blake, thank you. Thanks to Gemini. Matt, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Jason everybody and Gemini here. and everybody, thank you. and, and uh... Really had fun. All right, y'all. Well, good night, and uh, we'll look forward to the next book. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Take care. Bye. See you, Jason. <laughs>